people into convenience stores. And uh, that really kind of piqued my interest. And as I was reading the article, um, there were several quotes in there from uh, Jeff Leonard, Vice President for Strategic Industry Initiatives for the National Association of Convenience Stores. And so a lot of their, the things that was mentioned in this article um, really kind of tied into what we're doing with SNAP at Farmers Markets. It tied in with Farmers Markets as a whole. And so I contacted Jeff to see if he would be interested in speaking to our group um, and telling us what is going on in the world of uh, convenience stores and how perhaps we could partner with that organization. And I think some of the things Jeff is going to share with us today, it's really going to make us think outside the box and look at a new avenue for farmers markets and how to increase sales for farmers also. So Jeff Leonard is on the phone, and I'm going to turn this over to him at this time. Thank you, and thank you for everybody who's calling in. I have about 35 slides. I will move through them with decent speed, so we have plenty of time for questions. I'll also, for anybody that's calling in, try to talk about what's important in the slide so that it is of interest to you. I'd like to start off by saying that the timing for this couldn't be more perfect. I've had two meetings already today. They were not necessarily scheduled for today, both related to how do we sell more produce. And last night I also saw, was at the uh, Washington, D.C. screening of the new movie Fed Up, which comes out tomorrow. And for many of you, you probably know what it's about. I'll give you the 20-second summary. They basically said that we have a problem with obesity, with, um, with food in general in this country. Not all calories are created equal. There are some that are particularly bad for us. Uh, then it talked a lot about sugar, and it talked about how sugar is really the culprit in a lot of things going on right now. And they talked a little bit about solutions. They talked about how cooking is a solution. You'd also be very pleased to know that um, farmers markets were cited several times as a solution for how we can get out of this. Now, the food industry and convenience stores are part of the food industry did not look good in this. But afterwards, I talked to a bunch of people who are very much activists or ac active in talking about how to change things. And I talked about some of the opportunities that convenience stores have, and they were very excited. They said, look, we I say that as a tee up because I really see this as an opportunity. I don't, I don't want to look at this movie as we need to be defensive. I look at it as where is our opportunity in this. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through slides in this order. I'd like to talk about our image, the convenience store image, and why what we're doing now is important because it can change our reality and it can change our image, and they're both important. And then I'd like to talk about some of our opportunities that we have based on where things are today, we meaning our industry specifically, and our successes. And I want to break down our successes into two levels. One are programs that are out there, partnering with farmers markets, farmers market-ish things. But another point that I want to stress is it's not a if you build it, they will come program. There's also some marketing and some messaging I'd like to throw out there as ideas. And the last one, our, is our collective. That's all of us on the call and all of us involved in this. I want to talk about our future and what we can do together and then have as much time for questions. So with that, I'm going to go to the first slide here. And um, also, when we get to the end of the presentation, there'll be places to either call in and ask questions or raise your hand. Uh, if you've done this before, I won't go through all those. If not, the moderate, moderators will help you at the end. But I first want to briefly talk about, we do consumer surveys all the time. And we did one last year where we asked them about our image. And the ones in red I want you to pay particular attention to. What do you think about the products we sell? And this is positive. 38% say we're a place to get fresh, fresh food. 30% say we offer nutritious items. That's positive. But I will also say I wish those numbers were much higher. I also want to point out, I think this relates to farmers markets, what do they think about where our locations are? They're easy to get through. 
it get to. 95% feel that way. So that is a huge number and a huge opportunity for what we can do with farmers. Um, there's also the bad. And, and if we can't just talk about good. We have to be honest. They also say our products are overpriced. 82% say they're overpriced, and 78% say we sell unhealthy food. That doesn't mean that we don't sell healthy food. That means that we sell unhealthy food in addition to possibly healthy food. They also think that they're generally our locations create things either through us or because of a, a just because we're there that they also don't like uh, track trash, litter, traffic, and. When you have some of those negative images, this is what happens. And I want to go through three quick things that just have happened in the news over the last couple months. Quick Check is one of the best operators in New Jersey. They have a great sandwich program. They really, really are good. They have about 100 stores in the New Jersey area. They had a hearing earlier this year, actually in December last year. And of 100 people there, not one person stood up for them. At the end of the meeting, the, the, one of the quotes was the Chamber of Commerce president says, we need to protect our community. We need to protect our community from Quick Check. And this is what Quick Trip does. They are one of the best places to work for in New Jersey for a number of years in a row. They also have a real nice, fresh case. They have some of the best sandwiches you will find in a convenience store. They have fresh soup. It's a really nice place, but this is what the neighborhood wanted to protect itself from. So that's one example. I want to show you two more. Quick Trip, and some of you may be familiar with them. They, they do, uh, they're in the upper Midwest, and in Iowa, they're known as Quick Star because there's another Quick Trip in Iowa. But in Iowa, they had a, or I'm sorry, they had a hearing uh, February 20th, and about that time, within a week or so, Quick Trip was getting an award from Michelle Obama with a partnership for Healthy America, they are the first convenience store so recognized. And they're recognized because they sell 400 pounds of bananas a day per store at 300 stores. So you can do the math by the number of 400 pounds times 300 stores times 365 days a year is a lot of bananas. And they do the same with not that level with a lot of other produce. They were recognized. At the same time, uh, a citizen's hearing said, we don't want Quick Trip in our community. They're not what we're about. And I think a lot of that is misperception. I, not I think. I know it's misperception. There's another Quick Trip. They're also very, very highly regarded. And the reason that Quick Trip is the other one is called Quick Star in Iowa is Quick Trip also does business in Iowa. And uh, they realized that they were Quick Trip with a Q was better well known, so they changed their name to Quick Star so they could find a little bit more space in the state. We had a mayoral race last year where the mayor's main message was, I will stop Quick Trip from opening. And he won. Meanwhile, Quick Trip has been named by Fortune one of the 100 best companies to work for, not in the state, in the country. And they've done that for about 11, 12 straight years. So I just want to show you that even some of the best producers, some of the best operators in our business have image issues or misperception issues. So there is great opportunity for us to change it and change it together. And one of the things that we are stressing is we can be part of the solution. And that is, I think, what we heard last night from a couple people that we talked to at this movie premiere. We said that we are in a lot of these communities. We are in food deserts that are very rural. We're in food deserts that are very urban. And we can make a difference. And I think a lot of um, People who are studying public health also look at this. There's a very long article in the Atlantic last year, and I, I put the website there. It's fatandskinner.org. The full article's there a bunch, with a bunch of other things by the author David Friedman. And by the way, he's going to speak at our trade show this year, so I'm looking forward to that. I want to talk about our opportunity now. And our opportunity, I think, is if you look at where food is being sold today. And this was an article in the Washington Post in March when, when it was announced that Safeway and Albertsons were merging. And they, it literally was an obituary written for the supermarket industry. Now, that's not to say it's going away, but what they were saying is it's the end of the traditional supermarket. They, their premise was that oh, you are seeing an increasing amount of sales, produce, et cetera, going to the very big stores the Walmarts, the Super Targets, those stores, and also the very small stores, like the Trader Joe's and convenience stores. 
We're not there yet. We have quick trips selling 400 pounds of bananas a day, but that's not the industry norm. But I think there's an opportunity here. I think people are looking beyond the supermarket experience. They're looking for where else they can buy their food, whether it's convenience stores, whether it's some other place. And I just want you to think that way as I go through these slides. This is, the, this is what resonated last night when I talked to people. There are 151,000 convenience stores in the country, 34% of all retail locations outside of restaurants. And if you look at the other numbers compared to drugstores, supermarkets, dollar stores, there's all these others. There's a, cat, there's a group called Category Killers, which there's about 70,000. Those are things that just have no definitional lamp store, an electronic store, et cetera. 34% of all retail locations are convenience stores. So that is the opportunity you're looking at with produce. We're also a big part of the nation in terms of overall sales now. And about $700 billion, which works out to about one out of every $25 used in this country. When you spend a dollar, about four cents is typically sent, spent at a convenience store. It's largely for gas, but it is a growing number inside the store. And as long as people are buying gas, the convenience store can be the place to increasingly grow the in-store sales. All of that said, the key thing for us is we sell time. The average time it takes somebody in one of our stores is about three and a half minutes. It's probably even less than that, that now. But we even went through and we tried to figure out what songs are three minutes, 33 seconds. I mean, to, to get a sense. The Rolling Stones start me up. If you want to play that song, by the time it ends, you've gone in your store, you've gone out of the store, you're starting up your car, you've made the purchase. The other thing I will also want to note is that currently, 84% of our items are consumed within the hour. True immediate consumption. I think as we look for more produce, that number will go down, but that's where it is right now. The final thing is about customers. We have about one in seven customers now, one in, one in seven people in the country in SNAP. Uh, at the same time, about 15% of people in this country are on shift work, which the Department of Labor defines as something beyond first shift. It's something that starts, at be, the, the day starts, I believe, after 2 p.m. So whatever that shift is. So that's a significant number of people who may not have access to traditional ways of shopping, like the supermarket. That's not, that's not an overwhelming number, but it's a pretty significant number to take into account. How might people shop at 2 in the morning if they need lettuce, if they need produce? Our customers, if you look at the total number of stores, and this is all the math using the previous slides, 151,000 stores. Each store gets about 1,100 customers a day. That means on a given day, convenience stores serve about 160 million people, so about half the country every day. If you didn't go in today, you'll go in tomorrow. The other thing is I, I want to stress that we sell some healthy choices. We surveyed our members last December, and 72% said that they sell fresh fruit or vegetables. Now, these are joiners. First off, they're a member of our association, and then they're those that responded to the survey, but that's a high number. If you go across the country and you go to every convenience store, that number will drop. That's the best number we have based on 128 retail member responses. And this picture here is nice and easy grocery shops. They have a tremendous produce display. They used to work with local farmers. They still do. But they also have a produce manager that, that handles these sales. Uh, in that same survey, 39% said they added or expanded fresh fruits and vegetables. And here's another picture of another convenience store just to give you a sense. Uh, so we've gone from what is the opportunity out there to what is going on. And I wanted to lead this off by just showing, I'm sure you remember the movie National Impoons Vacation, and you're probably quoting some of the lines from it now. But the one that references our industry is Clark Griswold said, I'm so hungry, I could eat a sandwich from a gas station. And when you saw the movie in 1983, that got one of the biggest laughs in the entire movie. And there's for Clark figuring out where the gas cap is. Um, the idea is today there are fewer people that laugh at that line because convenience stores aren't necessarily a place of desperation for food, and oftentimes they are a place of destination. We had a bunch of stories last year where people are seeking out food at gas stations. You had USA Today, there's Washington Post, there was CNN, uh, MSNBC. Uh, there was actually something last year, Anthony Bourdain, who is, I think most people would say, he's, he could be called a food snob. He, he made a listing of 11 places you need to eat before you die. 
and it included space places in Asia, Europe, the U.S., et cetera. One of them was Oklahoma Joe's, which is a barbecue place in Kansas City that is in a Shamrock gas station. So that's where we are today with food. What can we do with some other things? Because that's a pretty big halo when people are thinking that, that uh, well about some of our prepared food. The first clip has no sound. We turned it off because it's difficult to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the best I can in narrating this. This is a place called Papa's Healthy Food and Fuel. It's in East Otis, Massachusetts, a suburb of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. This is a town in the winter. They have about 3,000 people. In the summer, it, it increases about sevenfold. And they were asked to do, I'll, I'll just start playing now, so I get to see. They have a farmer's market every Saturday, and he, he, you won't be able to see him talk, but you'll get to see what they did here. And what they did was they had a farmer's market seven years ago looking for a location. That's what this woman is saying. And this guy said, hey, you know what? I don't know what a farmer's market is, but sure, I got the land. And what they did was they took that and they allowed these farmers every Saturday to set up shop, to sell their wares, and it extended from there into other local sales. There isn't really a grocery store within 5, 10 miles of there. And he doesn't charge anybody. He gets great customer traffic. And at the end, what he does is he gets some of this produce to sell in the store the rest of the week. And he just says it's just been tremendous to how they are thought of in the community. So it's grown his sales. It's grown his traffic. It's grown his stature and his reputation. And he's doing the right thing. Wow, I ended that right on time. That was my translation. So I want to show you a couple other things. These aren't farmer's markets, but they're other farmer's market-like examples. This is a place, and yes, this is a town called Boring, Oregon. And they have a produce stand out front outside this Arco station where they just have a local farmer that was selling produce there. Uh, they had the land there. I didn't talk about the arrangements um, with them. We were driving through on the way to a video shoot. But simple room, and they, they make it work there. And here's another example. These are stores who are selling things outside. Nice and easy, on the right, is uh, used to work with a lot of local farmers. I think they still do. Watermelons take up a lot of room, so why not put them outside? Why, why else might they be outside? People pumping gas, people driving by can see them. That visual cue tells you there's something good going on in that store. So they're able to sell watermelons. They're able to enhance their reputation. And Tedeschi Food Shops, which is a grocery store chain along with convenience store chain, does the same thing. They create this farmer's stand look outside their stores in the summer months, and they do very, very well with it. A couple other partnerships I think are interesting. And Webster, Massachusetts, there is a produce store. and there are some fairly simple convenience stores, simple being polite. They're in rough neighborhoods. So the health commissioner said, why don't we send out a letter to the, uh, the, the high-end deli slash produce store and see if they will partner with the convenience stores that are in rougher areas that don't have the produce. And she was surprised to find all three convenience stores said, sure, I'm in. So what this produce how this works, it's informal, and it's for the first six months. Unfortunately, the first five months, I think it's snowed there. But what they're doing is they're selling produce to the convenience store a little bit above cost or at cost and allowing the convenience stores to get out some of that great produce. And they aren't feeling the competition because it's, it's out of their competitive area. And it's a really cool, generic, from the ground up program. And I hope to get there. Um, and I hope they continue this because this is a neat thing. I just wish the, the first five months of the year weren't so rough weather-wise. You also have grant money. And I, I, I titled this slide Effectively Using Grant Money because there are, there are grants and then there are grants at work. This was one example that I thought was really nice. This guy in Greenville, North Carolina, who's being hugged by a customer, had grant money to put in some uh, merchandising units to sell more produce. And he said since he's done this, he's lost 25 pounds because what he used to do is he used to grab the unhealthy snacks in the stores. Now that they're having uh, healthy items in their store, he's lost all this weight. And it's a pretty cool story. If you look at the store on the outside, it's not a pretty store. It has bars on the windows. It looks like it's probably in a rough neighborhood. But this is an example of what is possible. 
There also are solutions for small operators out there. This place, the Corner Deli in Los Angeles, they were featured in one of these news reports as having some amazing food, and they really do. They have all kinds of celebrities that go in there uh, in the Hollywood area. It's also incredibly tight and incredibly disorganized in the convenience store area. But I noticed in the corner they had a end cap that was for produce. LH Produce, I believe, is a distributor here. And what they did was they have an end cap, they fill it, they take out the bad stuff. They take out stuff that's, that's it's past its time. And they manage it. And it's, it's not setting the world afire, but as you can see, in a very crowded store, it found some space. And those are things anybody in any store can do. I think there's some opportunities for for farmers here. I think that there is more we can do with this. This is an example of a one-store operation that can do this. This is also cool, and I'm going to use my pointer a little for this. Hopefully people can see it. I was at this store last week called California Marketplace. It's just south of Cincinnati, and it's in a pretty rural area. What this is is a convenience store slash grocery store. You can get your gas here, and if you want to treat it like a convenience store, you walk in this door here where the guy is on the cell phone. Um, and it looks, this is what it looks like inside. It looks like a traditional convenience store. It has the candy, has a couple registers, it has grab-and-go items. You might not be able to see it in this picture, but if you look in that picture, uh, my pointer isn't showing it, you can see a sign that says produce. So you walk in, and it's like, oh, it's a convenience store. But there's a whole other store there, not separated by walls. So if you want to treat it like a convenience store, great. But it's kind of set up the idea other things can happen here. And you walk in the main door, it's a grocery store. It's a 12,000-foot grocery store. It's a small grocery store, but it's a grocery store with some pretty good stuff. Uh, and it serves this community. It really works well. The other thing is the amount of land that he has. You can see there's some plants and things like that. He sells a lot of produce outside. That's a great thing to do to entice people that are driving by. They see all this stuff going on, might stop by for the first time. Programs work. I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about marketing ideas, how to think outside the box, as Jan said at the beginning. This is a convenience store, Nourish Market, outside, pretty ordinary, but what they really believe is selling really healthy items, and they also act uh, outside the box. There is a Taste of Falls Church Festival where the best restaurants in Falls Church exhibit, they show up at it. So the concept of farmer's markets coming to a convenience store is one thing, the idea of convenience stores going to markets is another cool idea, expanding the thinking. There are things out there. Another one I thought was interesting is we're going to visit this uh, store in two weeks. Um, it's called Diaz Market, and it's right outside New Orleans. They have a series. And if you go to their website, I think on Facebook uh, you can find it if you type Diaz Market. They have a series of videos, about eight videos, with this local trainer, and this trainer talks about the healthy options that can be purchased in stores, getting the message out there. And I asked her, I said, how, how did you find this local trainer? She said, well, she was a friend of mine. She asked for a favor that can we do this to put flyers out or something about their gym. And then she said, can I do anything for you? And I thought about it and said, well, you're a trainer. You know nutrition. Can you talk about it? And at the end, there's a little bumper for the gym. So both sides win. Now, if you're a convenience store, and the one thing you may not be able to see in this picture, she's about eight months pregnant. If you have an eight-month pregnant mother, personal trainer mother, talking about items to purchase in your store, do you think that you will be believed? I thought this was really cool. Now, the, the personal trainer said, oh, I wish I weren't pregnant. It's like, no, that was perfect. Uh, these are the things that are possible. Quick trip. I mentioned sells 400 pounds of bananas a day, and the way they do it is they communicate and they sell it in multiple places. It's not just sold one place. They put it everywhere. They have pump toppers by the uh, gas pump telling you they have these items and what the price is. You go inside, you see it. It acts almost like a grocery store, even though it's a convenience store. I want to throw you a couple more your way, and then I want to end with some final thoughts and, and see if we get a good half hour for questions. One other thing I think is important is you need to explain to people why they want to eat healthy. And, and with Nourish Market, they have a uh, uh, tent uh, 
one of those uh, tabletop tents that explains in about three sentences why soup is good for you. Another one, Bola Market in Brooklyn in the middle, talks about why organic is good. Not just that it's organic, but why organic is important. And the third one, I thought, uh, was also interesting because it doesn't just say that produce is good. It tells you why it tastes good and when it tastes good. So I think it's important wherever we're selling more produce is we sell with a story, too. It's not just stocking and selling. It's literally selling with a story. We also have seen that as much as we want to tell people it's healthy, healthy doesn't necessarily carry the day. People don't want to hear healthy. They probably want to hear fresh or tasty or something like that. This is the, the ballpark in Pittsburgh. It's one of the nicest stadiums I've ever been to, and I've been to a lot of them. This was a sold-out game, and there's this one uh, stand called Just For You Healthy Options, Healthy Choices. All these people are pouring by. There's one person buying something. It happened to be a bottle of water. And you could see the other things they sold there, why people weren't stopping there. You can go to the Promonti Brothers, where they have the sandwiches that have uh, french fries stuffed inside. They're delicious. You can go to Manny Sanguian's, and you can get the pulled pork on a pretzel roll that has pierogi stuffed inside. They are also delicious. Trust me, I know. Um, sometimes you just need to find the right environment. And I, I'm sure they get some sales, but they probably need to look at something different in terms of messaging to make sure that they can get more of those people walking by to stop by. Another place I went to last week, and you probably think I just go to baseball games. I was lucky. Went to the ballpark in Cincinnati, and United Dairy Farmers is a convenience store chain. They have a shop within the uh, within the stadium. They sell snacks, and it, it looks, if you can see, there's a pretty decent line there. They sell uh, sodas. They sell all kinds of stuff. They also have a beautiful produce display. And unfortunately, it's beautiful in part because nobody's taken anything from it. Uh, it looks great, and, and it literally looks like a museum. People weren't picking up stuff because they just they weren't in the mood to get an apple at the ball game. So. It's great to convey an, an image, but you still need to, to find a way to sell it. And the final point about that is there's a uh, convenience store chain, gas station chain based in Atlanta, Georgia, called Racetrack. And they had a great pump top for a couple of years. And they basically say, which is our industry, people are different at different points in the day, week, month, you name it. And those who may buy healthy one day may not the next, and vice versa. So it's really about offering options. And offering produce, offering fresh doesn't mean everybody will buy it all the time, but it means that you have more opportunities to reach more people, particularly the coveted uh, female shopper. And I want to end with setting up for what our future is for the discussion. We did a uh, recap of the survey we did last year asking customers about convenience stores and healthy options. And there are four questions I want to show you. Convenience stores are a place to get fresh food. Last year it was 38%. This year it's 43%. They're getting it. They're seeing it more. D they offer more nutritious items. It's gone from 30% to 49%, which is an enormous jump. That's enormous. It's 65%-ish, uh, something like that. Convenience stores are offering healthier, nutritious products and service si serving sizes. That's gone up from 55% to 64%. The last one I don't take as a negative. I take it as our opportunity, our meaning everyone on this call. Convenience stores need to do more to address health and wellness concerns. Last year, 66% said that. This year, even more say that. 73% say that. What that tells me not is not that convenience stores are doing a poor job, but that the customers are ready for this. And they're ready for it at convenience stores and other places, and this is our time to do it. So with that, I want to throw out a couple things just in terms of farmers markets and in terms of SNAP to just start some of the discussion. Uh, there are about 8,100 farmers markets uh, across the country, at least according to a, a National Geographic article that uh, came out this month. Some of the things you want to think about if you're a convenience store and you want to look to have a farmer's market. Do you have the land? Are you able to do it on a large scale or on a small scale? It's easier if you're rural and you have an empty lot next to you or a lot of parking. There is some oversight coming with farmer's markets. I know in the D.C. area, they have largely been, uh, the, the government has usually stayed out, but they're getting a little bit more in looking at safety related to things like eggs and things like that. 
I had mentioned earlier the positive value beyond just sales. That is critical. That really is about our image and showing that we're part of the community, that we are making a difference, that, that we are truly the corner store. And if you can't do a farmer's market, can you do a produce stand? Everybody probably has a farmer within easy driving area of the store. Can you partner? Can you find a store that you think doesn't have sufficient produce and see if you can partner? Maybe it's a large chain and you try on a small scale. Maybe it's a, a small chain and you try with everyone. Now, in terms of SNAP, um, there are new regulations that will be taking effect. And I think most convenience stores will still be able to hit the mark on what's required. The, those that might not be able to, unfortunately, might be those that you most want to because they will be in the most urban areas or the most rural areas. They will be those that are most least likely to be parts of chains. They might not be able to make it, but that doesn't mean that these new regulations aren't. We're, I'm not suggesting that these new regulations uh, are a bad idea. That's not my role in this. My role is just to say, here's where we are in the scheme of things. So that's the thinking. I kept it to about half of our, of our allotted hour and my voice just cracked. That is my contact information. What I will do is I'll make sure that Jan gets this, and at the end of the call or in an email, she can, if anybody wants it, send her a note. She can send you the slides. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderators and see if anybody would like to talk or ask questions or anything like that. Okay, Jeff. Um, we have a couple of questions, I believe, that have come in. And uh, the first question is from North Carolina, Karen. It says, what kind of support can your organization provide for small convenience stores that want to buy produce? Do you have any cooperative purchasing opportunities? We don't currently, but that is the big objective this year. And there are two groups that we're working with right now. We're working with the Partnership for Healthier America and we're talking to them about how we can get more companies like Quick Trip that, that can hit this, this high bar in terms of how, do they, uh, how can they change how things are sold in stores. Another group we're also working with is United Fresh. And we're looking, they, they are pretty much most of the things that you'll see in a produce uh, area in a store. How can... Um, more produce items go into stores, particularly the smaller stores. There are some state associations that are not directly affiliated with us in various states. North Carolina happens to have two. And I can work with you if you want to send me a note um, in terms of seeing if we can get somebody in the area to say, hey, do you have a good suggestion? And like I said, these state associations are not uh, directly affiliated with us. We talk to these folks a lot. We have the same interests. The difference is we lobby on a federal level. They lobby on a state level. Uh, otherwise, I think that we're pretty in line with how we want to change things here. And um, we can suggest stores if you have ideas or you want to. We don't directly share member information because that's not the way member associations work. But we can check with them and say, hey, so-and-so is interested in working with you. Let's see if we can put you guys together. If we get a yes, we move forward. Okay. I think that's great. Um, the next question came in from Diane, and I think it's New York. Um, it says, the question is, we've tried reaching out to our state association, haven't had much luck in trying to make connections. Is this something, Jeff, that you can help with? I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, we can talk offline. Uh, each state association's uh, different. Um, the New York one's really good. And depending upon, now, the interesting thing about a couple of those slides I showed you, uh, when, when the reporter called me about what's going on in Webster, Massachusetts, I had no idea. Uh, he was calling from the Worcester Telegram, and Worcester is a, in, a, in the middle of Massachusetts. And he said, there's this town uh, that they're doing this stuff. And I said, well, I know the area fairly well. I went to the undergraduate school in, we in Worcester, and my parents are from Webster. And he says, well, that's what I'm calling about. And so I knew exactly where he was talking about. It, it was kind of interesting for that. You mentioned New York. I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I went to grad school in Syracuse. So I know New York pretty well. 
and maybe I can guide you. And I spent about a decade working in New York City, which is a different animal entirely. But maybe we can talk offline, and I can talk to you about what might be out there and potential uh, working relationships with various groups out there. Uh, nice and easy, has it all figured out. But there are some other operators there that could use an awful lot more help. Now, my, I don't know if I'm still on, but let's talk offline about that. Uh, I'd like to give you some more answers on how we can help you. Okay. Um, next question. The grant money from Greenville was CTG funding from the North Carolina Division of Public Health. Through CTG funding, they received from the CDC. I'm not quite sure. I think it's just talking about funding, but whoever would type that, if you want to call in or I could talk a little list. bit about grant money. Okay. There, uh, grant money, I, I think that grant money can do an awful lot of good. And I, I don't think any industry, any any retail group would ever want to discourage grant money. Uh, the, the challenge with putting in new programs is um, it has to be done effective. And I'm not suggesting that some are done less than effective, but it has to be sustainable. It has to, you have to set it up in such a level so that when the grant money expires, the program doesn't fail. And, and with, with doing grants, I think the key thing is to also change consumers. It's not enough to just get coolers. And, and I'm not commenting on specifically Greenville. There have been other areas where I've talked to people that have uh, seen grant money go, and they say, look, it's great, but it has to be sustainable because sometimes these run out with an administration. Sometimes they run out after that. And if it just goes back to once that runs out, they don't have the same access to produce. They haven't established those relationships. Then pretty soon you start seeing the um, the ice cream bars creep back into a cooler, and and you don't see that same level of produce because the the the, the relationship hasn't been established where the customers know how to buy the food, the communication hasn't been done to the customers how to how to buy it from them, and the retailers just haven't had that full cycle of understanding. So that's key with grant money. Grant, the money is the first part. Changing things is the second part, and that's that's unfortunately the harder part. It is. It is. Now, I, I just one of the next questions deals with you know produce requires different types of storage that is costly for owners to purchase, and do you have suggestions where those folks um, could obtain financial resources to purchase the coolers, etc. Coming up, I do want to say that coming up here in either June or July, um, we do have a speaker from the ASC office, part of USDA, where there is federal grant money to help um, farmers. And I'm not sure if this would fall into the producer category or not, but we'll get some information on that. Um, you know, there's federal money available for cooling and um, harvesting type of equipment. So we'll have somebody from the ACS office on in a couple months to talk about those issues. Yeah, and I, I, I since I can't get in the time machine and say that's exactly what that person said, uh, I, I will talk a little bit about, in, in a lot of areas, people don't know what's possible. And particularly in some of the more, um, when you're looking at some of these one-store operators that aren't part of a chain or very small chains, two or three stores, they really don't know what's out there and, and how important uh, refrigeration is and cooling is so that you can maintain profit, a product for a while. Because one of the challenges is bananas send a really powerful message or any fruit that looks great that, hey, your sandwich program is probably good, all these other things are good. But when those bananas or the, that fruit starts having fruit flies dancing about or the bananas start looking like they really should be banana bread, 
it really calls into question everything else. Well, should I trust this guy's gas? Should I trust this guy's uh, sandwiches? Should I trust anything? Because that's sending a negative message now. So what happens when you start adding more produce and start adding more fresh things? You're getting a little bit away from where our traditional model had been for a while, which was largely packaged goods. You're talking about things that are perishable now. And there needs to be a uh, an education process that there will be spoilage. You will be throwing things out. You will be looking for other uses to things. But the one thing you don't want to do, if you have that same promise on the coffee, that our coffee is made every X minutes, and if it's, if it's hit that expiration date, you throw it out, you have to do the same thing with food. And unfortunately, what happens is sometimes somebody may have a bad experience. They haven't stuck with the program long enough, and they say, well, the customer traffic wasn't there. Now, that may be true, but it also may be that it just wasn't enough time to build it. And it's almost like the oft-quoted thing about restaurants. 80% of restaurants fail in their first year. I, I don't think that's – I don't think anybody's demonstrated that number. It was said on a reality show, a restaurant reality show, and everybody took it as fact since then. But it's probably not far offline. And what happens is with restaurants, why they fail is – they spend most of their money to open, and they haven't allocated money for that first or that second year to stay open, to continue to market, to tell people that they're there, because otherwise people may not know. And it, I think a lot of that is with produce. You, you can't just put in the program. You, there has to be a communications aspect where you have to talk to people. And and you have to understand the total package. I need this because this will keep more shelf-stable products. If you're getting deliveries once, twice, three times a day or daily, you, you need to know what, what things will stay fresh the longest and how do you treat them. If, if you're in an area like Texas and it's over 100 now, do you want to keep produce outside? You probably don't. And as much as it might send a positive verbal uh, visual cue, um, it's not going to taste very good, and it's 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 ultimately going to fail. So, those are the things I think that as our industry gets more into this, and as more people share ideas, and hopefully we hear more ideas from you, we can do this, and we can say, hey, you know what? It's 102 in El Paso or or somewhere around there now. No produce outside today. It's got to be kept in this range if if you want to continue to sell this because with fresh produce or with fresh things. It's almost like the restaurant model again. And and what happens is when you go to a restaurant and you have a bad experience, you don't tell anybody at the restaurant anyway. Um, they come around, how was the meal? Oh, it was great. You know, can I have my check? You don't tell anybody. You go home, you get on social media, and you trash the place. And you tell all your friends. You tell them how awful it was, and you'll never go back. And you never do go back. That's the challenge I think you sometimes face with produce. If there's ever anything... Um, with produce that turns out you know, that, that apples are mealy or there's something else wrong with produce, you're going to say, no, that's it. That was my experience. That was There's something visceral about food and fresh food and, and, and restaurant food that's different than other things. So that's the key. It has to be perfect every time. And if it's not perfect, you have to have a mechanism to hear about it. Right. Um, next, I want to move on to the next question. It says, how much leeway do we have in moving healthy foods to chain-type stores? We know that there are contracts with vendors that can restrict placement in high-traffic areas. That is a good, that is a, a good question, and then that shows uh, a, a pretty good understanding of how our industry works with the planograms and things like that. It, it, there, we don't necessarily have some of the same slotting fees that grocery has. Um, where, where you pay for prime real estate, uh, I think we're often less thought of as places for slotting fees. So you don't necessarily have those. I also think some of the opportunities might be in, in somewhat non-traditional places. If you look in most convenience stores, the walls are all either frozen or cold vault. You have all your drinks and some of your frozen stuff along all the walls. And then the center store tends to be the snacks and the general merchandise. So where does produce fit in there? One place that you're seeing is, as I showed in some of those earlier slides, is the non-traditional places. 
someplace maybe as soon as you walk in the store, in that decompression zone, you have something there. We have seen stores that, uh, and actually there's even like a Walgreens, which is not a convenience store, it's a drug store, but there's one downtown. And it's one of the nice Walgreens, it's one of their showcase ones. When you walk in, the first thing you see is fresh cut flowers. And this reminds me of uh, what Sheets does. Sheets is a convenience store chain, and they're very big into food. And what happens, the first thing you walk in with Sheets is you see uh, Gourmet Magazine, Southern Living, a couple of these other food-based magazines. And I asked him, I said, do you sell a lot of these? And he says, well, it doesn't really matter. What we're doing, and I'm sure like with the fresh cut flowers, is we're setting the mood. We're setting the expectations about what we're about. So that might be a difficult area to, to negotiate with one of the chains, but that also, uh, given the right focus in talking about, you know what, if a woman's coming in to pay for gas and the first thing they see is those amazing um, vegetables and fruits that are possible, that woman might come back. And convenience stores, the challenge is, we often call it our, our best customer, it, it very, very affectionately, Bubba. And Bubba is less discriminating than women. And, and I, can, I can agree with that. Uh, women are a little bit more discriminating on, on what they will buy or for their family or for themselves. So if you can show as soon as somebody walks in the store that you're serious about fresh, that might be your best argument into increasing the amount of fresh in your store. So first thing you see or right outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Uh, for the markets that are set up outside the convenience stores, do the stores set limits on what can be sold at the market? Are they allowed to have non-produce items which may compete with existing products at the convenience store? What you normally see outside a store, uh, if you dry, over the winter you saw windshield wiper fluid, you saw firewood, uh, mulch. When I was out in the Midwest, it was a lot of corn pellets for the deer hunters. Um, this time of year, you may see 12 packs, 18 packs of soda or something like that. You traditionally don't see food outside. You may see drinks outside, but you don't see food outside outside of produce. You're not going to see packaged. You're not going to see candy bars. You're not going to see snack chips. I don't know if that quite answered your question, but, but outside seems to be perfect for for the fresh, for things that I think, hey, it's I outdoors. I think you might have been talking about like the example of a, a produce stand or something outside. Well, if, if the store has its own produce stand, sometimes mm -hmm. it may work with multiple farmers, uh, like for instance pumpkins around Halloween are, are a great idea. So they may have multiple farmers, but if they're a large enough chain, they may have their own produce buyer, they may, they may look at something out. If they can't do it, and they think it can make them money and drive traffic, they'll consider it. Mm -hmm. So that okay. may answer the question. So basically each market or farmer would have to, I would say, share that information with the convenience store owner on what they're going to be selling. Yeah, I, I think the easiest way to sell is to, to look through their eyes. And when you're able to say, look, this is the kind of customer that this will bring in. We see that what you have there currently isn't addressing this, and we think we can grow your sales, and, and we can, and, and just the, the margin dollars and what else is involved when you're able to sell more produce. How does that increase the ring? How does that change the customer base? And uh, what might else people be buying? Are they going to be not just getting gas? Because when you buy gas at a convenience store, it's probably worth it. This is, I probably should let off with this. The average markup on a gallon of gas from the retailer's perspective is about 18 cents a gallon. That's the difference between the wholesale cost with all taxes and the retail price. Now, from that 18 cents, that's not profit per gallon. Credit card fees are probably seven, eight cents right off the top. And then you have various other expenses. And you're down to about three cents a gallon. So gas is a traffic driver, but it's not a profit driver. And if somebody's just getting gas, they're of some value, but they're 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 about they're about a quarter profit per customer total on a fill up. So you fill up twelve gallons, it's worth about a quarter. Um, if you can get them inside the store to buy produce, you've changed that mm -hmm. dynamic. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, next question: Do the stores or markets 
reach an agreement about the amount of produce that will be sold or purchased at the end of the market day for those that buy from markets who set up outside convenience stores. So that question deals with, let's say you have a market stand or a farmer's market outside your convenience store. At the end of the day, those farmers have leftover produce. And you could reach an agreement with the owner to buy some of that leftover produce mm -hmm. that they could sell in the store when you're not there. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and it, 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 there is no hard and, and set way of doing that. The gentleman that I showed the video, Larry, if you go to their website, um, he's a car guy. He, he was a car guy, and he said, hey, do you know what? I'm really committed to being healthier. And, and so that's how this whole farmer's market came up. Their, their website looks like a car repair place, and it, it, that, that's really what it expanded from. But what he said is they're in an area that uh, there isn't a grocery store nearby. And so he doesn't buy from everyone. Uh, he doesn't need wood carving sold in the store, although he does have one out front. Um, but he buys smart for what he thinks people will use. So you see things. In the summer, there were carrots, there was there were radishes, and there were onions and things like that. Corn, of course, when it was in season. So, just because you're part of the farmers market doesn't mean he's going to be buying from you, because he had so much room and he sold it inside and he had a, had a cooler for it. But um, it, it it does extend the farmers market beyond that because otherwise you're packing all the stuff up. And and he mm -hmm. said he got a, a good price on it. You know, it, was, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the hometown discount, but it was a good price. And, and their way of saying, hey, you know what, there's some cost in us sending it back and all this stuff, so can you sell it and do you have a relationship? And, and that, that helps spin, it, spin the flywheel forward. Okay. Next question deals with SNAP education. And the question is, could SNAP education staff partner with convenience stores to educate staff and customers regarding safety, storing produce, and sharing nutrition re uh, nutritious recipes. When I'm giving this presentation, one thing I want to be clear on, while I am a spokesman for NAX, I don't want to necessarily say that I am the decider on all these things, but I don't see how I can't answer that question, yes, sure, let's do it. Uh, that, that's not a binding agreement, but one of the things we've been talking about is can you do simple recipes? And somebody, um, Jan, I think you mentioned uh, an hour or so ago, why can't you do things like having um, Tuesday uh, BLT days where um, yeah. we, have, we have all the ingredients for BLTs and, oh, by the way, you have corn on the cob too. So you almost set up like a repetition. And one of the things I was saying was, um, you know those Geico commercials where they have the camel and it's hump day. Um, I think some of us called Wednesday hump day, but then this commercial came about, and my ten-year-old kid is saying it's hump day and you know, make, making the camel's voice. It's a matter of repetition, and all of a sudden you start thinking BLT Tuesday, got to stop at the store, and and so sometimes it's it's not just passively sticking products places, but it's actively engaging them, and then using things like social media, sending tweets out. Um, stores do this, farmers can do this, there are ways to do this. And, and thinking about ways like that that can deliver the message out to people so it's naturally part of how they think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, to me it would be really advantageous for that farmer or the market who is there um, to hand out recipes with their produce, whether they're selling it directly to consumers or directly to a convenience store, um, a farmer could pitch it to the convenience store owner that, hey, here's some recipes so your customers can, you know, look at this, they can pick up the produce that I'm bringing, and it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Convenience stores don't sell snacks, they don't sell drinks, they don't sell gas, they don't sell cigarettes, they don't sell whatever. They sell all of that, but what they really sell is time, and they sell solutions. Okay. When somebody's coming into a store, they're trying to stop a hassle. They might be thirsty, so they need to get something to drink. They might be hungry. They might be getting something to eat. And if they're getting something for dinner, they don't want to have to think about it too much. They want to be in and out. You know, cue start me up and then let that play through and think about how long they're going to be in the store. So when you do things like recipes and you put them 
if you have produce or whatever in there, and you're here's here's the equivalent of a Rachel Ray recipe. It's like here's the three items you need. We have three of them. We have two of them. We have one of them. And here's the 20 minutes they'll take out of your life. That's what people want to see when they're coming into a convenience store. I like that idea a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good one. Okay, next question. They would like you to clarify what snap changes you were referencing in your presentation. The idea of going from four to seven in terms of uh, uh, per category, if I said that correctly. Uh, just that uh, the, the requirements are, are they're, they're not set in stone yet, but they're, they're increasing. And uh, I am not an expert on SNAP, so I don't want to get too far out on a limb in terms of talking about it. I'll let somebody else who is uh, more familiar with it take the lead on that. But um, SNAPs, the, 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 I don't think anybody in our industry wants to sell things that are less than nutritious as part of SNAP. What they want to do is be part of the solution for SNAP. And, and the best way, I had asked somebody just jokingly, I, um, a, a friend that, that sells in Indiana, and I said, well, you know, why do you want to be part of SNAP if they're just buying this or that and it's not really you know, good and, and all that other stuff. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm trying to set him up to rile him up. I'm not, that's not what I believe. And he said, I'll tell you what SNAP does for us. In our areas, we have an awful lot of people who are single car families. The breadwinner's gone for the day with a car, and you have somebody else that needs to get things to fix for dinner. They can't take a bus. They can't take a series of buses to go to a grocery store to pick up these items, yet they can get the milk, they can get some produce, they can get some things and fix the dinner by walking or some way that's a lot more accessible than 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 a grocery store. That now the grocery store fits a role for the big shop when the breadwinner's home, but oftentimes for these fill-in these these things when the car's not there, the convenience store is a really really good fit for Snap. Okay. okay next question: Are you I mean, when they say you, I'm assuming the association. Um, encouraging store owners to work with an existing market organization. That way they don't need to concern themselves with, and my thing keeps moving, oversight issues. I think that the easiest to start is the best. And so if there are existing things, like I, I could put people in touch with Larry in, in East Otis. Um, he's, he's been so helpful on so many things and just say, hey, look, you know, how do you want to start this? Maybe he needs to be on one. Maybe he should have been on this phone call instead of me. But, um, yeah, it always makes more sense instead of saying, okay, I'm going to start a farmer's market. What do I do next? Do I, do I, you don't look up farmer in the phone book, and, and I guess I sound old by even mentioning a phone book. But um, the easiest way to do it is, is probably the way that, that most people will take. So... If there are ways to, like I said, there are an awful lot of state associations, and I can't promise that, that we can get to yes when working with people, but if people work directly or shoot notes to me, I'll certainly, I'll certainly give it my effort, and I'll, I'll show you how we might be able to do things. I think there's a really cool um, opportunity here, and I think that there's a really cool, once you start building this and we start having successes, and then we all reach out to our local reporters and just say, hey, do you know what? Here's something cool that's working. Um, these are the kind of stories that really fit nicely with the local news, the feel-good stories that end the day about here's how a community is working together. And it doesn't have, we'd love it to be convenience stores. If it's somebody else, great. But those are the feel-good stories the, net, the networks and, and the, the local news is looking for. Okay, we're almost at the end of our hour here, and we went through the list of questions. Um, so, Jeff, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to the group. And um, I think if everybody, you know, they continue to have questions or issues, you're willing to... I may have dropped off. Did I? No, you didn't. I think Jan, are you still there? You. It sounds like Jan is breaking up a little bit. Okay. Well, 
everything she said, yes. Uh, yeah. We we really believe that we can play a role with nutrition. I think that when you see what is possible in changing the dynamic of what that movie tr uh, Fed Up is all about, I think we have a great opportunity here. I think that um, we all can play a role. And, and I'm excited about where convenience stores are situated. One of the things that was also cited in the movie is there's a lot of other uh, channels that sell food. And they cited electronic stores, office stores, places like that. They are selling snacks. They are selling candy, just like we are. The difference is they are so small in terms of their food footprint, they aren't also able to offer other things. They're, they're selling food as, oh, by the way, we are selling food as part of our core, and we have the ability to sell more fresh food. And I think that um, it's great that other stores are able to offer customers different things. I think we have something that's between these very small format food things within non-traditional food stores and grocery stores. I think the big role we can play there is pretty exciting. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, it sounds like Jan's phone is still not um, connected. And so um, I think we're going to wrap it up for the day. And um, if anybody has any questions, then feel free to email Jan or Jeff, and um, they'll respond right away. And I have been recording this, so I will send the, the link to view this presentation to Jan, and she'll get it out to everybody. Great. And I will send my presentation to Jan within five minutes. So anybody that wants it, I'll send it as a PDF. So um, that's available as well. And I thank you all for, for um, taking time out of your busy days. Thank you so much, Jeff. Have a Thank great you. afternoon, buddy. Bye. Bye.